Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash hamnation. By DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your shack, plus the fastest shipping in the industry. Most in-stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday until 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash hamnation and by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash hamnation. This is Ham Nation, episode number 350 for May 9th, 2018. Morse code enables the disabled. Good evening, everybody. From uh, Belleville, Illinois, that's just outside of St. Louis, in our other home, it's Bob Heil, and uh, we've got everybody here tonight. We're going to talk about ham radio. And uh, let's let's go see who all's here and what we got cooking. First, let's go out to Gordo on the West Coast. How you doing, Gordo? You didn't get in any of that uh, stuff today, did you? Or was that yesterday you had a little shake up? Yeah, we had an earthquake. Our earthquake monitor uh, went off uh, faithfully, although I was still in bed. Susie said she heard it. Uh, yep. So we have quakes out here in California. Bob and Sarah, happy 20th anniversary. Back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. 20 years she's put up with this nonsense. <laughs> oh, golly. What's happening in Mississippi anyway? It's George Thomas. Hi, Bob. Well, you remember last year we drove, uh, not last year, last week we drove out to the transmitter site, but we didn't go inside tonight. We're going to go inside and have a look around. But um, I, I had a good time this past weekend in Lafayette, Louisiana, at uh, the D-Star Day down there for the Delta Division of ARRL. A uh, really fun event. Uh, we're going to have the video posted of that soon. It was long. It was uh, seven hours of video. So there's some dead stuff we got to cut out of it, and we'll, we'll have it back up and let you know when that's available. But I saw a good friend while I was there, Bob. A really good friend? Well, but another friend from the show. <laughs> ah. Okay. Well, that one. Mr. <laughs> Will Banks. How do you how are you, Don? According to this button here, I'm I'm not Will Banks. Um You're not. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, it was fun at the uh, Delta Division uh, D Star Day. D What was it? Uh, Triple D plus 1 Delta Division D Star Day. Uh, I guess they didn't want to do 4D. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah, it was a lot of fun, and and I I won something. I don't know what it is yet, some kind of a gift certificate. So that's cool. I had to leave early. But you're probably wondering why I'm having all these lanyards. I mean, I do have a, I kind of have a thing for lanyards, and I'm going to talk to you about, later on about these, uh, and also this, which are some cool, uh, some cool things you can get at Hamvention in Xenia if you're going. So uh, stay tuned for that. And happy twentieth, Bob. Uh, Dawn and I will be celebrating thirty four. Coming up wow. in September. So if Sarah needs any help on how to uh, put up with uh, multiple decades of lunacy, you just have her get in touch with with Dawn, and I'm sure she can. You two can. They'll talk amongst themselves. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, um, I, I, before we get on, Gordo's got some really good stuff. Well, everybody does, but before we get back to Gordo. A thing came across my computer. Actually, it came from uh, a deal that Leo was doing uh, Monday covering a Google event. And it was uh, 17,000 people, I think, that were all people that are are using Google. And, and they're really people that building all kinds of different things and 
uh, one of the guests that they had on this show was a lady, and I'm just going to shut up, get out, uh, get out your, your your tissue, maybe. And for all you guys that think Morse code's dead, watch this. This is totally amazing. Let's hear from Tanya. Hi, I am Tanya. This is my voice. I use Morse code by putting dots and dashes with switches mounted near my head. As a very young child, I used a communication word board. I used a head stick to point to the words. It was very attractive to say the least. Once Morse code was incorporated into my life, it was a feeling of pure liberation and freedom. See you later. I think that is why I like skydiving so much. It is the same kind of feeling. Through skydiving, I met Ken, the love of my life and partner in crime. It's always been very, very difficult just to find Morse code devices, to try Morse code. This is why I had to create my own. With the help from Ken, I have a voice and more independence in my daily life but most people don't have Ken. It is our hope that we can collaborate with the Gboard team to help people who want to tap into the freedom of using Morse code. Gboard is the Google keyboard. Um, what we have discovered working on Gboard is that there are entire pockets of population in the world, and when I say pockets, it's like tens of millions of people who have never had access to a keyboard that works in their own language. With Tanya, we've built support in Gboard for Morse code. So it's an input modality that allows you to type in Morse code and get text out with predictions, suggestions. I think it's a beautiful example of where machine learning can really assist someone in a way that a normal keyboard without artificial intelligence wouldn't be able to. I am very excited to continue on this journey. Many, many people will benefit from this, and that thrills me to no end. Wow. Is that amazing or what? Just by moving her head, I hope you could see that. There were two little wow. pads left and right. Uh, uh, you're not... You know, you've only touched the beginning hearing about her, I'm sure. I think we're going to be hearing much more from what she's been doing. And uh, so there you go, everybody. And talk about learn more code. See, anybody can do it, but it's uh, her and Ken's life. So I did copy down something, though. I noticed that little interface he had. It was a tandem master Morse dot two USB interface. Tandem master morse.2 usb interface i have to look that up and see what all's going on there but uh, while we're all wowing in that let's uh <laughs> let's go see what gordon's got i got something else here but let, uh, we'll get that after gordon gordo uh you're okay after all of the shake up down there right go ahead oh yeah yep we're fine bob in fact, we're listening for Morris Code, hopefully coming all the way over from Hawaii on the two-meter band. But before we take a look at our atmosphere and the weather layer and all the excitement that the VHF and UHF bands have when we have a high-pressure system, let me give a high five to some great magazines that I think all ham should have at least one or two subscriptions. Nuts and Bolts, great magazine. Ward Silver had several great articles all about uh, all the activities we do in ham radio. CQ, CQ continues to stay on schedule and uh, their latest issue is quite a hit. But I gotta tell you, the king and queen of all magazines, and Bob was on the front cover with his fine board project uh, a couple of issues ago is QST. And let me tell you, QST has more color, more enlarged pages in print, I mean, it is the best. So uh, we look forward to seeing everybody at uh, the uh, Hamvention. And uh, each of these uh, magazines will be there. But folks, if you're not a member of the ARRL, you should be because QST is the best. Congratulations to everyone 
that pulls that magazine together each month. Well, let's head for the skies and take a look at our atmosphere. So if we go ahead and start the uh, short shots, here we go. Well, this is a normal day out there, whereas we go higher in altitude, uh, the temperature goes down. For every 300 feet, we lose one degree. For uh, every mile, we lose 20 degrees Fahrenheit. As we go higher, we uh, have uh, less moisture in the atmosphere. Every 1,000 feet up, we lose a half a gram of uh, uh, moisture and pressure decreases with height logarithmically. Uh, for every uh, uh, 10 mil, make that 10 meters of altitude, we lose one millibar. And for every kilometer of altitude, we lose 100 millibars. And that's on a normal day. But you know, every so often in May, for sure June, and absolutely always in July, our atmosphere, the weather layer, does something a little bit different. What occurs is a high pressure system will override a big area of the United States and will become stationary. And these stationary high pressure systems will begin to drop called subsidence. And when they meet the cold air down at the surface, they get compressed. And when you compress air, what happens? The temperature goes up. Well, when the temperature goes up in a stratified air mass, you'll find that it many times will become so refractive that it'll do things to VHF radio waves that you wouldn't believe. And as you'll see here tonight, to optical waves that you won't believe either. Well, same thing occurs when we have a warm air mass overriding ambient cold air. Many times there'll be a refractive index great enough to cause VHF and UHF signals, FM, sideband, CW, to travel literally hundreds of extra miles. So communications could take place from New England down to the Florida Keys, Texas uh, all the way down to Yucatan, uh, California all the way to Hawaii, Chicago is here in Texas. I mean, when we get weather systems like this during the summer months, interesting things happen. Automatic position reporting system. Uh, if you go on to an APRS site called mountainlake.k12.mn.us, you'll actually see where APRS packets go a lot further than just one or two little eye gates. So we watch our APRS unit. And we see all sorts of things. Well, we might see a balloon as we did a few years ago, uh, just drifting around at 74,000 feet. But you know, you don't need altitude to take advantage of tropospheric ducting. What we need is that high pressure, stable air system. And here are two high pressure, very stable people. That's Don Arnold, W6GPS on the right. And Leo with Kenwood out in the Los Angeles area. And they were instrumental this past weekend of really getting our APRS units humming, uh, the Kenwood D-72s, for a large public service event we were doing out there. The Coast Guard many times will report it's picking up long-range echo returns from vessel far out at sea, well beyond VHF. This is our big Coast Guard monitoring station here at Point Furman. And on their radars, they're getting images out uh, well beyond what would normally be line of sight. Generally, radio waves are uh, going four-thirds over the horizon with a little bit of bending. But microwaves many times will even go further, as seen on this 9 gigahertz marine radar system, uh, causing the radio waves to go a lot further. And here's another look at uh, radar aboard small boats getting a real boost thanks to that high pressure system overhead. Mariners have a different version of APRS. It's called AIS, Automatic Identification System. And they too are getting signature hits of vessels hundreds of miles away when they're on their local radio bands on VHF Marine Band. So all sorts of things happen when we have high pressure systems and we have stratification. And you can see that next time you're out on the highway, look ahead. Well, is that water in the road? Well, let's take a little closer look. Oh, no, that's a reflection of the truck well ahead. 
And that reflection is really a refraction of the optical waves above, refracting off of the superheated air off the pavement and bending that signal back to us. So you can actually see the effects of tropospheric ducting. Off Southern California, we have an island 26 miles across the sea called Catalina, and there's a little notch on Catalina that looks normal. Two hours later, that same notch with the seagull looks abnormal. Two hours after that, the notch begins to become a bridge. We're watching this. Two hours later, that notch now becomes a well-defined ridge and a great tunnel. This is the same view. And now you begin to see that superheated air just capping the smog layer down below off the cool water. And as we look again, wow, what a sight to see. It is a phenomena that uh, occurs many times over cool ocean waters when we have a high pressure system settling in. And now look at this. It's masking a lot of the island. You can't even see it due to the refraction of the light waves coming in from above. And most amazing, this is a shot in a lifetime, in the background off to the starboard of the big tanker's bow is a refractive reflection of that tanker actually seen off the warm air inversion layer. So this summer, we encourage all of you to get on your VHF and UHF radios, even microwaves, and take advantage of tropospheric ducting, usually occurring in the presence of a high-pressure system overhead, and many times the trigger for a strong, week-long tropospheric duct are two or more hurricanes to the south moving north. We can take a look at computer renditions at dxinfocenter.com and be sure and spell center, C-E-N-T-R-E.com. The red area and the buff area back to the red area to Southern California extends all the way to Hawaii, where with a handheld, you can many times work some of the stations in the Mauna Loa area. That volcano, by the way, really... Uh, uh, giving off uh, a quite uh, spectacular show right now. And if we look at water vapor, we'll see that it's undisturbed from the Southland all the way to Hawaii. Well, for those of you on the East Coast and those in the Midwest, the same thing occurs. And that is the sinking hot air will develop a tropospheric duct. And you might be able to pick up the VHF weather station two states away on 162 megahertz. So I encourage all of you during times of high pressure systems, and this is the late Paul Lieb, KH6HME, that pioneered many of the tropospheric records from Hawaii to California. And um, the um, uh, Hawaii end is Fred and his team of experts that beam a signal back to us over 2,500 miles away. So weather conditions look good for this summer for hot weather, for a long tropospheric ducting season. Here is a record breaker from Hawaii all the way down to Baja, California, setting new records. And who knows, maybe you'll set a record or two. But remember, the tropospheric duct only lasts in the presence of still calm air. And you see that dark area with the letter U? That means it's unsettled. And when we have unsettled air, say goodbye to the tropospheric duct. But the tropospheric duct will appear big time throughout all of the United States and here in Southern California, generally on July 1st. That's when we'll see the most activity. So take advantage of tropospheric ducting. When it's real hot and it's sticky outside and you see that band of brown air, it's going to do something interesting to your radio waves. Here we see radio waves in layers, but they're actually not radio waves, but light waves. And look what happens when we bring this up and we get to this area here. Do you see it immediately turn green? And if we go above that area, it's out of the duct. So here is a tropospheric duct, and you can see that it'll actually bend a light wave all the way back. This is the layering of the atmosphere that creates all of the excitement for ham radio operators being able on the two meter and 440 band to work repeaters hundreds 
hundreds, maybe four and 500 miles away with just 25 watts of power and a single vertical antenna. So have fun with tropospheric ducting. Bob has uh, been doing this for years and years, and we've got pictures of him on his big tower. And Bob, uh, how about telling us what your best uh, DX range was for days on end during high pressure times when tropospheric ducting is at its best? Bob? That all happened in 1962 from Marissa, Illinois, 50 miles southeast of St. Louis. And um, uh, several times I worked each one of the coasts, and I, I thought that was amazing. Oh. Uh, thinking, wow. uh, th got to think about uh, the gear that we had in those days. We had to build it. Uh, I built my two-meter converter, had it on a 51J4, uh, uh, 51J3 uh, Collins receiver, but uh, you know it, it was tough. Uh, it's a lot easier today because the gear's all there. But it still is remarkable what you can do, and guys need to really go after it. I mean, it's it's to me, Gordo, and I think you'll agree. It's uh, it's really real time radio because you you really have to work to get just one little blip of a contact, right? Oh boy, you're absolutely right, Bob. And at the Dayton Hamvention next weekend. We're going to be promoing a uh, tropo duct along with live demonstrations, uh, maybe even some uh, fluid management with uh, okay. light waves. And, of course, we'll have all of the sounds of long-haul tropo ducting on 2 and 432, Bob. That's great. That's great. Well, we have a lot of things happening. Uh, 10, I think it's 1015 is the Ham Nation Forum uh, in Building 1. Uh, last year we had nearly 400 people there. Wow. So uh, join us there at uh, at the, the Ham Nation workshop. Then uh, immediately after it, we're going to do a, a session on the new parametric receive audio system that we will introduce there. So we'll have a lot of fun, and it's always good to see everyone. I think uh, George and Tommy will be there with some video, so be able to play some stuff afterwards. But I'm really getting excited. Dayton is going to be a monster this this year. I really feel that. So we'll make that happen. Before I get out of here, I had a really cool thing. One of our uh, our friends from the pro side of Heil Sound sent me this great group of pictures. So let's roll it. I think uh, you're gonna you're gonna know all about this, Don. Check this out. But mm -hmm. uh, that's Mr. Beck. And uh, you can check real close what he's using for a microphone. That was a custom <laughs> built. <laughs> that's a custom built Chrome PR35. That's and gorgeous. there are several others that showed. Just great. And uh, if you've never experienced Beck in concert, whoa! Yeah, he was a uh, really really good at the uh, festival. I hear. So uh, you, you didn't make it, did you? Were you able to be there, Don? No, did not go to Jazz Fest uh, this year, unfortunately. I had tickets, but just scheduling issues, couldn't go. So uh, I, I gave my tickets to a good friend of mine uh, who really, really seriously needed to go see Jimmy Buffett. So uh, oh, yeah. he went to go see Jimmy Buffett. But uh, yeah, Jazz Fest is great fun. It's, uh, yeah. it's two weekends. It's the last weekend in April, first weekend in May. It's seven-day music concert over two weekends. And wow. a concert is just doesn't even do it justice. I mean, it's just it's a it's it's a mega happening. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I thought New Orleans you'd Jazz it. and Heritage Festival. Yeah, look that up. That's those are cool. That's neat. Uh, I saw. Um, uh, in fact, Rick Springfield has a new video out, and it's called uh, the Voodoo House, and it looks like he's using uh, Heil microphones as well. They're they're flat black bodies with uh, brilliant chrome heads, and they yep. look uh, they look a lot like. A lot like one of these. This is right, yep. same shape. So looks like he may be using your mics as well. Yeah. Okay. Like well, I thought you'd enjoy those. Good Thanks stuff. Thanks a lot, everybody. Very cool. All right. Well, listen. Go, uh, go play with your bride. Twenty years, man. Go, uh, go hanging around with us, hairy legged ham radio operators. Go, go, go sit with your funny honey. That's what it's all about. My Happy anniversary, couple, Bob. That's it. Twenty Bob years. Sarah Heil. Wow. Two of my favorite people on the planet. Happy anniversary to you two. Just love you both. Absolutely love you both. Right, let's talk about Rocket Mortgage because everybody needs a mortgage at one point in their life if for no other reason than to buy a piece of property to put a tower on. 
Now, Rocket Mortgage was created by Quicken Loans for the very simple reason is that the mortgage process just simply wasn't keeping up with the times. It was dated. It needed a client-focused technological revolution. And that's what Quicken Loans did in creating Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. And that can be a traumatic experience. But Rocket Mortgage makes it simple. It allows you to fully understand all the details and be confident that you are getting the right mortgage for you. It's convenient. Their trusted partners allow you to share your financial info with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button. Powerful. Whether you're looking to buy your first home or your 10th, Rocket Mortgage will help you perform thousands of calculations in seconds. Actually do it for you. Based on your income, assets, and credit, Rocket Mortgage can analyze all of the home loan options for which you qualify and find the one that is just right for you. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully. Mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash hamnation. That's rocketmortgage.com slash hamnation. Rocket Mortgage is an equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. Rocket Mortgage, thank you for helping us out here with Ham Nation. Hey, I was on the big shortwave last night, WTWW 5085. And, of course, we're on 12.105 as well tonight with the huge signal into Africa. Uh, they're carrying the Ham Nation uh, audio, so uh, always a good time on the second Tuesday. Come and listen to me and Ted. As we hold court on whatever it is we happen to be uh, talking about, last night we were talking about uh, big shortwave transmitters and all kinds of cool stuff. So you can probably go back and find it on the podcast if you missed it. But um, WTWW is the uh, radio station. It's in uh, Lebanon, Tennessee. And if you'd like to email them with some information that you have for ham radio stuff, because they run a lot of ham radio programming and Newsline and Ham Nation, as well as a bunch of other stuff, email at wtww.us is the address. Email at wtww.us. I'm going to tell you all about this coming up here in just a minute. But first, let's hear the news of the week from Amateur Radio Newsline. From Amateur Radio Newsline report number 2114, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, May 9th, 2018. It's been argued that in this world of the Internet and cell phones that amateur radio is more or less obsolete. But when lives are at stake and conditions render all modern communication systems unusable, amateur radio operators prove time and time again that our obsolete system works. That is definitely the case in Flagstaff, Arizona, where the Tinder fire, started by an illegal campfire that was abandoned, burned more than 11,000 acres and damaged or destroyed more than 40 homes so far during the last days of April and the first days of May. As reported by 12 News in Phoenix, the local Aries chapter, led by District Coordinator Joe Hobart, was ready to take to the airwaves when cell service at the fire line began to fail. Hobart, along with husband and wife team Bill and Mary Lou Hagen, were setting up at the Coconino County Emergency Operations Center on Sunday the 29th of April when the traffic started to flow through Aries instead of the cell network. Hams in the field are helping to relay traffic to and from the front lines and are working with authorities to coordinate evacuations if necessary. Mary Lou Hagen told the TV station, that's what you're here for. You're here to help your neighbors, and there are neighbors, and the firemen, you have to support them. As Newsline goes to production, the fire is still burning and has only been approximately 7% contained. If you're in the area and need more information, please call the EOC at 928-679-8393. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Paul Brown, WD9GCO. The amateur radio community is grieving the loss of an influential and well-known amateur radio operator. Sandra Hine, WA6WZN of Costa Mesa, California, has become a silent key. Sandy died at home on April 28th after a long illness. Sandy was a longtime fixture of the National Association of Broadcasters Conventions in Las Vegas, where she would be seen at the ARRL booth and the reception held for amateur radio operators. When the ARRL held its national convention in 1992 in Los Angeles, she had a major hand as an organizer. Her activities with the ARRL included her generosity through the League's Maxim Society. She was also a life member of the ARRL. Sandy was a member of the Quarter Century Wireless Association, a past officer of the Young Ladies Radio League, and a number of other local clubs, including the Orange County and the Palomar Amateur Radio Clubs. 
She was the wife of Fried Hein, WA6WZO, ARRL Honorary Vice President and past ARRL Southwestern Division Director. They were married for 57 years. Sandra Hein was 75. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Christian Kudnick, K0STH. What's it like to work a satellite with your HT? The newest member of the Newsline family, Andy Morrison, K9AWM, tells us all about it. The Desert Radio Amateur Transmitting Society of Palm Springs, California, is best known by the shorthand RATS, its initials. But on May 15, the club will be more likely known for its association with SATs, that is, satellites. The club is hosting ARRL instructor Clint Bradford, K6LCS, during its regular monthly meeting, and Clint's talk will focus on how to use an HT to work amateur satellites. Clint is also optimistic that this presentation won't be all talk. He's anticipating more than a few satellite passes during the session, and they are expected to be workable. The meeting will begin at 7 p.m. local time at the Palm Springs Fire Department Training Center, and hams in the region can get talk in via the 146.940 repeater using a PL tone of 107.2. Meanwhile, hams wanting to program their radios for the scheduled satellite passes should visit his satellite website for a tutorial and a frequency list. That website is work-sat.com. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Andy Morrison, K9AWM. If you were thinking about nominating someone for the Bill Pasternak WA6ITF Young Ham of the Year Award, you only have a couple of weeks remaining. You'll find full information and the nominating form on our website, www.arnewsline.org. Just look at the top under the YHOTY tab. Nominations close at midnight on Thursday, May 31st. For the rest of this week's Amateur Radio News, please listen to the full Amateur Radio Newsline report online on a repeater near you or on shortwave radio station WTWW at 9930 and 5085 kilohertz. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news for four decades and counting at www.arnewsline.org. With Paul Brown, WD9GCO, Christian Kudden at K0STH, Andy Morrison, K9AWM, Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT at the news desk in New York, and our news team across the globe. I'm Don Wilbanks, AE5DW. 7-3. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. Now, here's the solar update with Dr. Tamitha Scove. We are finally beginning to calm down from that solar storm caused by some fast solar wind. And we have three new bright regions on the Earth-facing disk that are keeping us company. Those stories and more in the news this week. Space weather this week has been pretty active. We've been hit by some fast wind from this huge coronal hole that has rotated into the Earth's strike zone, and it has hit us hard. We actually got to a moderate level storm, and it's brought aurora in many places in the world. Right now, we are still in the fast solar wind from this big coronal hole, and it will likely continue over the next few days as things begin to slowly but surely calm down. Meanwhile, we've had three new bright regions on the Earth-facing disk, two of them actually Actually are numbered active regions and these are boosting the solar flux uh, for you amateur radio operators and emergency responders back into the marginal levels so you should be enjoying some decent radio propagation right now and these regions should stay with us over the next week or so before they begin to rotate to the backside. Now they're not flaring very much, but we are watching them for potential solar storm launches because they actually have launched one on the sun's backside. Switching to our M-flare threat meter, you can see the X-ray flux is still extremely low. We are still at solar minimum conditions. We're well below the B floor and therefore the solar flux is also extremely low. Luckily, within the past few days, we've had these new regions rotate into Earth view, which has boosted the solar flux and the X-ray flux just a little bit. And this has bumped us back into marginal uh, propagation conditions for you amateur radio operators and emergency responders. Now, we should enjoy this for maybe easily the next couple days, but we are beginning to watch these regions as they start fizzling. They're also going to be rotating to the sun's backside here in about a week. So expect this boost to be short-lived. We should only have about five to seven days before you begin to notice the radio propagation beginning to go downhill once again, but enjoy it while it lasts. Switching to your solar storm conditions, you can see at the beginning of the month we were actually quite quiet and then 
bam, on Cinco de Mayo, no less, the sun celebrates by slamming us with that fast solar wind. And some of us forecasters thought the storm actually hit a bit early, but I've been assured by Chris Mosel and Mike Cook, who are excellent follows on Twitter. If you don't follow them, they're wonderful uh, space weather forecasters, so you really should, that when you look at stereo data, the stereo data actually shows us that this storm hit right on time and it slammed us up to a moderate level storm by the 6th, brought us some gorgeous aurora over much of the world, although the northern hemisphere, I think, got a bit better show than the southern hemisphere this time. Meanwhile, we're still in that fast wind today. We, things are beginning to calm down. We're getting back into unsettled conditions, which is good news for you amateur radio operators. The bands are probably beginning to recover now. You're probably getting some decent propagation again, and things will continue to settle down over the next week. Switching to your solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are still feeling the effects from the fast wind from that coronal hole that gave us a moderate level storm just a few days ago. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting unsettled conditions with up to about a 30% chance of a minor storm. At mid latitudes, we're only expecting unsettled conditions with about a 25% chance of active conditions over the next few days, and this should settle down slowly as as the week progresses. Switching to your solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, everything is still in the green when it comes to solar flares, but as you can see, we actually have two numbered active regions on the Earth-facing disk right now that we're watching very closely, one of which launched a solar storm on the sun's backside. So while it's not a flare producer, we're still keeping our eye on it. The good news is that it's caused the solar flux to bump back into the marginal propagation levels for you amateur radio operators and emergency responders, and we hope that will last easily over the next couple days before things begin to go back into poor propagation. So the space weather this week has been extremely active. We're just beginning to calm down from that big solar storm that hit us just a couple days ago from some fast solar wind, and it brought gorgeous aurora views all the way down to Colorado. So your aurora photographers, you get a break this week as things begin to calm down, which gives you time to kind of pour over all the amazing photos you've gotten. Now, you amateur radio operators are also getting a break, but in a different way. We have three bright active regions that are on the Earth-facing disk right now, and they're boosting radio propagation easily over the next couple days and possibly over this entire week before they begin to rotate to the sun's backside and things go back to dim. And then you GPS operators, well, the solar storm is dying down, so that means good news for your reception. You should be getting cleaner signals. I'm Tamitha Scove. Thank you for watching. Hey, is this up? Does this look okay? Yeah, that's fine. It's upside Wait. down? No, it's not upside down. How does this? I got it on. Is it bent? It's not. Does this come off? <clears throat> okay. That's about as messed up as a soup sandwich. <laughs> they corrupted my Scove. Well, follow her on Twitter anyway, at Tamitha Scove and on Periscope. I think she's been looking into the sun too long. These buttons, they're just taking on a life of their own. Something else that you can, you can find these at Hamvention, by the way, in the, the uh, Newsline booth over by the Heil Sound booth, which is where the uh, Newsline and Ham Nation booths are. They only made like 500, so if you want one, I'd suggest you get over there and snag one. Uh, I tell you, a great um, souvenir if you're in a lanyard, so I've got a lanyard fetish. I don't mind saying. I think I'm about starting a support group. But the uh, Venture Crew 73 Scouts, look at this. These, these uh, uh, ah, there's a bug on me. It's a uh, Formosan termite. It's swarming season here right now. They're everywhere. Anyway, uh, these lanyards are made by the uh, Boy Scout Venture 73, Venture Team 73, Venture, Venture Group 73. And they are... Hamvention lanyards, and they've got one from just about every year. I've got, I think, I've got all of them on here now, and you see they're all different colors. They're very well made, very very comfortable, but uh, they will also laminate your ticket and hang it from your lanyard. It's very very cheap. It's a great souvenir and very practical because you don't have to go looking for your 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 ticket. It's laminated and attached to your lanyard. So what else they have are these uh, these buttons that you can, or not buttons, but uh, it's a patch, an actual official scouting patch very very nice they have those for sale as well 
great souvenirs of uh, of hamvention and uh, especially the lanyards that they're they're very inexpensive they're enough where you could go in and buy i don't know 10 or 12 of them um, and come back and pass them out at your local club for those who didn't get to go to Hamvention. Say, hey, I brought a souvenir for you, something you can use with oh, your car keys or your work badge or whatever. But anyway, go and support uh, the Venture Group, Venture Team 73 there, right as you come into the gate at Hamvention. Good people, Boy Scouts, support them. They do good stuff over there. Somebody who supports us is DX Engineering and... Because it is Hamvention time, DX Engineering, of course, is going to be there. Uh, and if you're making the trip to Xenia, you definitely want to spend some time with DX Engineering, the whole team there, and check out all the innovative stuff that they're bringing to the show. The DX Engineering booth is located in Building 1 of the Greene County Fairgrounds at Expo Center, right near the hall's main entrance. Technical staff can help you solve any issues with your station, plus the DX Engineering uh, booth there has a bunch of exclusive show specials. You see somebody walking around the show wearing DX Engineering credentials. Do not hesitate to stop and chat. They're uh, great folks, and they'll, uh, they'll tell you anything you need to know. Just a small sampling of some of the new stuff you'll find at the DX Engineering booth. DX Engineering has upgraded versions of Clifton Labs buffer amplifier kits that let you add a Spectrum waterfall display to an older transceiver. They're available in two models, uh, Universal and for the Elecraft K2. And if you got a tower, DX Engineering's tower accessory shelves feature a multi-piece design that make it simple to uh, fit a rotor plate to the midpoint of a Roan or Amorite tower. The mast lock mast anti-rotation uh, assembly locks the uh, tower mast in position, allows you to remove the rotor without having the mast slip downward. It's practical and it's a safety, a safety issue as well. Color-coded ferrite noise reduction kits take the guesswork out of choosing the right toroid or bead for the desired frequency, the multi-purpose dual-mode chassis receive device box serves as the connector and the power interface for two DX Engineering plug-in modules and receive filters. And, of course, DX Engineering will be demonstrating a beta version of the new conversion kit that lets you add 160 to a DX Engineering 7580-meter full-size or quarter-wave antenna. You can also find the DX Engineering team members all over the fairgrounds throughout the weekend. Check out the schedule posted under the general news at dxengineering.com. We'll tell you exactly what events DX Engineering is involved with. The whole staff will be at the Contest Super Suite every night. We'll also attend Contest University. If you're going to four days in May, DX Engineering will be there too, even though most of the DX Engineering team will be at the show. The order lines are still open for those of us who can't go for one reason or another. You can always order at dxengineering.com and via the phone. The technical staff will return on Monday, the 21st of May. Uh, just leave a message, send an email or call back. And as always, DX Engineering will take care of you just as quickly as they possibly can. DX Engineering ships faster than anybody else in the industry. Most orders placed by 10 p.m. Eastern are shipped same day. Proven Products expert advice, DX Engineering helps you shrink the globe. Request your catalog or shop online 24-7. 365 at dxengineering.com slash hamnation, dxengineering.com slash hamnation at hamvention. And uh, they're good people. Another good guy is George Thomas, W5JDX. What do we got with smoke and saw? Oh, we got tales from the transmitter site. Ooh, I love this. It's like story time. Have another oh, drink. Excuse me. I was enjoying a little tea there, Don. Well, there you go. Uh, yeah, we, we do have some more from the, um, transmitter site there. You know, we drove up last week. That's as far as we got. We really didn't, uh, take the tour inside. So I've got a little more this week and we're actually gonna, we're actually gonna have some transmitter porn, Don. So I know you'll be looking forward to that. Ooh. This is a thousand gallon butane tank that feeds generator. The 480 volt three phase feed coming into the facility, as well as a spare thousand gallon butane tank. And out there, you can see the field which needs to be cut. This time of year, it's still too wet to get in there and cut it. Uh, hopefully they'll be able to do it before too long. Right now, I sure hope I don't have to go to those towers. 
There's three towers down there that are shorter than a quarter wavelength. The way they do that is top load the tower. Now there's another tower right here beside the building. And on top of it is a 950 megahertz link. That's the STL or studio to transmitter link. That's how the audio gets out here. This is the generator transfer switch. This is what transfers the 480 volts between the utility coming in and the generator. Just a big relay and some control circuitry. And you can see where there's been a transformer meltdown in here one time. That was due to a lightning strike. And now we're entering the transmitter building. Down here at the far end, that blue and beige cabinet there. That is a 50 kilowatt AM transmitter. Nautel made by the fine folks in Canada. It is solid state. It is a fraction of the size of a tube type 50 kilowatt transmitter. And since I've been here, it has been trouble free. It's not on right now. I'm operating on the nighttime transmitter testing at Right between the two transmitters here is a phaser cabinet. And this is what controls the switching between the three towers out there and the center tower. Now well, let's look inside. You adjust these dials here to adjust the phase and power distribution between the three towers. So what's inside the cabinet? Can't get far enough away to get a full shot of it. But this is basically it. The same thing you might see in an antenna tuner or very similar. Just a lot of coils and capacitors as well as a couple of RF contactors or relays. And that's what does the directional antenna magic. Now this little blue and black transmitter with the gray front is a one kilowatt solid state transmitter. We only run this one at night when we go directional and we have to reduce power. It's fairly quiet and runs fairly cool. And I've really had no trouble with this transmitter since I've been here either. Now in the rack next to this, got a UPS on top. And then that top unit there is a Marty STL receiver. That receives a 950 megahertz audio signal. And that's how we get the audio to the transmitter. Next is a modulation monitor which is not switched to read right now while we're operating on this transmitter. Below that is the phase monitor. And this is how we measure the performance or actually the power and phase between the three towers is with this device right here. Below that, we've got an audio processor. This compresses the audio and limits it to keep us from overmodulating, but gives us a good loud signal. Below that is some more monitoring gear, a temperature sensor, and a remote control system where we can call in, take meter readings, make various changes on the transmitter site remotely. Now, all this stuff doesn't automatically connect together and everything just works. You've got to have a few relays to make that happen. And right here, is the rat's nest that does that. Now, <laughs> all of this was here before I got here, and I think it took two or three engineers to uh, 
get it to this condition over the years I have actually had to do some work in here before and it's not easy since there's not a schematic of it so I try to stay out of that as much as I can so there you go that's a, a little look around inside that building now I have a little more footage I'm going to see if I've got enough uh, to put together another segment and if we if we do we'll be looking at that uh, someone in the chat room asked there, where's the EAS gear? Well, that's back at the studio. So um, in the big transmitter there, we didn't actually fire it up in this segment right here. I do have some footage of it running, though. It's a little bit louder in that building, and that's actually a 60-kilowatt transmitter there. We're only licensed for 50, which is the most you can license an AM station for in the U.S., but... Uh, the transmitter will actually do 60. So you get, got a little headroom there. Um, well, that's all I can say about that right now. We'll, we'll have a little more uh, next time, hopefully, and see a few more things around there because that just barely is the tip of the iceberg on that. So hope you enjoyed it. You know, last week I asked a question out of Gordo's book here, out of the general class book. What does the feed port impedance of a half-wave dipole antenna, uh, how does it change as the antenna is lowered below one-quarter wave above ground? It steadily increases. It steadily decreases. It peaks at about one-eighth wavelength, or it's unaffected by the hike above ground. Well, Mark Whitehead, KG5HEM, knew, and he said, well, George, it... Um, it steadily decreases, and that is correct. You know, as you lower the dipole, a uh, half-wave dipole, below a quarter wavelength above ground, the impedance does decrease on it. So congratulations, Mark. Gordo is going to be sending you uh, your choice of one of his study guides, technician, general, or extra there, and uh, hopefully you'll be upgrading your license soon with the help of Gordo. For next week, well, I've got another question here, and Bob's gone, so I'm, I'm going to give away one of his books here. It's the Heil Ham Radio Handbook, second edition, and lots of great information in here. Uh, charts, tables, formulas, tips on how to build some things, um, talks about propagation, just all kinds of great information in this book right here. And as a matter of fact, he shows how you wire up one of these right here. And that is an XLR connector right there. Uh, some folks call it a Canon connector. It's that three-pin microphone connector. What I want to know is which of those three pins connects to ground or to your shield. If you think you know the answer to that, send it to me, hamnationcontest at gmail.com. And you might be next week's lucky winner. Uh, I did want to mention that uh, this Friday night at 8 p.m. Central, if you're looking for something to do, join us over at live.amateurlogic.tv. Uh, we're going to have uh, a live stream there next episode. And a lot of fun going to be happening there. But right now, we've got a lot more fun coming up in the moment on Ham Nation. We've got a message from ICOM, and then we'll be right back. Spring is in the air. Check out ICOM's line of D-Star radios. ICOM offers a variety of high-performance and innovative products, and you can stay connected around the world with ICOM's D-Star radios. ICOM's newest D-Star handheld is ready for the season ahead. Lightweight, compact, and tough, the new ID31A Plus is a great choice for any shack, or those in harsh environments. 70 centimeters analog and digital terminal mode, access point mode, and its IPX waterproof rating. The ICOM ID51A Plus 2 provides extended D-Star coverage, allowing you to listen to whatever you want. Terminal and access mode, send and receive text messages and pictures, DV fast data mode, and easy FM repeater setting. The compact and user-friendly ID4100A is a D-Star mobile with big rig features. Its intuitive interface 
variety of operating modes, and Bluetooth capability make this the preferred D-Star option for those on the go. Integrated GPS receiver, new dot matrix display for enhanced DR mode and GPS information, terminal mode and access point mode, applications for iOS and Android devices, and there's a micro SD card slot for voice and data storage. ICOM's ID5100A has taken innovation and mobility to the next level. With its touchscreen and internal GPS, this radio is a must-have while assessing a situation. 5.5-inch display responds naturally to the touch. DVDV Dual Watch receives both FM-FM and FM-DV modes simultaneously. VS-3 Bluetooth headset provides hands-free communications. And you can show your position, course, and speed with the integrated GPS receiver. Learn more about D-Star today. Visit icomamerica.com slash amateur. And you can tune in and enter to win after each episode of Ham Nation. Go to icomamerica.com slash Ham Nation. Register to win some great swag prizes like t-shirts and hats. While you're there, learn how you can win a monthly grand prize drawing for a new radio for May, that new radio is the ICOM ID4100A, entry-level D-Star Mobile with big rig features, VHF, UHF, dual-band transceiver with built-in GPS, micro SD card slot for voice and data storage, Android and iOS apps are available, and it's got the DV FM near repeater search function. Uh, so most all the great features that you would want on a rig right there in the economical ID4100A. If you'd like to win, uh, well, go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation and sign up right there. Uh, tell them you want to win. And who knows, maybe your name will be drawn at the end of the month here. And be sure to go after each episode of Ham Nation and register. That means you can register every week for that. And... This past weekend, we had a, a great, uh, as we mentioned earlier, a triple D plus one D star day in Lafayette, Louisiana. Uh, we streamed that live, but Tommy and I shot a lot of video there. We're getting it edited. I'll let you know as soon as it's uh, posted. Some really great information there. A lot of things I did not know, but uh, if you're doing MCOM stuff, um, and, and you need a way to pass your traffic and all, it appears that D-Star is much more capable than, than any of the other systems I have seen that uh, you can use on VHF and UHF for this. Uh, and, and I didn't know what the differences were and how it was being used, but uh, some great uh, information is going to be there for uh, MCOM operators. And now we've got our friend Val in here, and Val, what in the world of DX are we talking about tonight? It's a potpourri of stuff tonight. Um, I'm going to start, I'm going to switch things up just to keep Victor on his toes. I'm going to do my slides first, Victor. Um, you know, I, I just got a big stack in the mail. I get about this many, I don't know, every couple of months or so from my bureau. Um, and it's a lot of work to fill all these cards out, you know, by hand. Um, there's a lot of software that'll print it up for you. But it occurred to me, I, in this stack, I had some SWL cards, shortwave listening cards. And I remember the first time I got them, I wasn't sure how to fill them out. And I went looking online and it was really hard to find um, how to do that. So I thought I'd show you guys uh, what I had learned. And I, I, I found it online a, a while ago, hopefully it's correct. But if you wanna show that first slide, um, this is a, a car, what a card will look like. It won't have, be, have your typical call sign. It will have the country code prefix on there, but then it'll have a bunch of numbers after it. And um, they're going to tell you that they heard they heard me work uh, Italy Oscar Five Papa. And so then I looked in my log, and uh, sure enough, I worked Italy Oscar Five Papa on um, October thirtieth, two thousand sixteen, at thirteen twelve on twenty meters. So if you want to show the next slide, this is how you have to respond. Um, I filled in the date and the time and the band, and then I crossed off the two-way because I, he was a shortwave listener. And you got to make sure that you cross off the uh, uh, signal reports because you don't really have a signal report with a shortwave listener. And then I put down below who I worked, and I put the mode I worked him on, and then I sent it back to the bureau 
um, to sugarpapa2-09181. So hopefully that'll help you guys if you get those weird ones in the mail for the shortwave listeners. And we got to help those guys out because that's the... Uh, um, the feeder drug, so to speak, for ham radio. Hopefully that guy's going to be licensed within a year. Uh, if you want to show my next slide, um, uh, some cards, if you see there, it's kind of circle hard to see, but some cards that you can get, you can actually buy them. If you get a lot of SWL cards, uh, they have a box you can check that it was just confirming your SWL or the shortwave listening. So um, my cards didn't have that, so that's why I did that. But while this card is up, I wanted to see if any of you guys notice what's missing. If you look in the lower right-hand corner of that card, see the PSE TNX QSL? Well, he didn't circle either the PSE or the TNX. So when I get that card, I'm not sure if he needs me to reply back because he didn't let me know that please QSL or thanks QS for the QSL. Thanks, I don't need to reply back. Please, he wants me to send a card back. Now, I remember when I first started getting cards years ago, I sent an email out to the reflector. I didn't know how to handle these. Do I reply or do I not? And I'm going to tell you, 90% of the people on the reflector said when they get these, that they don't reply. So if you're sending cards out and you're not getting a response back, it could be because you're not circling the PSE um, when, you're, when you want to get a card back. So it's just a little bit of etiquette. Um, if you want to show the next slide, um, oh, oh, sorry, next slide after that. Um, see, that guy put a PSE, so he's going to get a card back. And the next slide, um, he put a TNX, so I know not to send him a card back. So it's really good etiquette when you get these, especially when you get big stacks like this. Um, I want to know, do you want the card or not? So please circle that. And when you're sending them out, you know, do that to help the other guy out. Um, now let's move on to Dayton next year. Um, I wanted to kind of give you a little heads up with Dayton and parking. Um, uh, some of you that went last year, um, you know, that parking lot was um, weather. Uh, it, it was uh, conditions of weather. So if, it, if it's very wet, that parking lot can get very sloppy. Sure, you're right there, uh, but it can get really sloppy. What we did, we went to the Zena High School. And I'm going to tell you, it's just if you just come in south on 68, we had no traffic because we were coming in uh, on 68 instead of uh, Zena Road. And uh, as soon as we got to the McDonald's, we hung a left right there on Kinsey Road. We parked in the McDonald's parking lot, had a free shuttle. They knew the back way in. We never sat in bumper to bumper traffic ever. And the shuttles are free back and forth. And uh, there's also one at the Times Square area in the old Kmart parking lot right by the Wyndham. Um, I don't know. I've not been to that one. I don't know how it is traffic wise to get to that one. But I highly recommend uh, if you want to get in and out of uh, Hamvention really quickly, I highly recommend the Xena High School one. Also this year, they're doing something new. I heard uh, the other night on a podcast. They're going to have a place where you if you buy a lot of gear. You know, but a lot of people want to park in the parking lot because they buy a lot of gear and they don't want to have to walk far or take a shuttle bus to get to their car. Well, they're going to have something where you can leave it at a tent there, right? And then then you can go get your car and you and it's a pull in. You get your gear and you leave. So that's a really cool feature that they're going to be doing this year at Hamvention. So just want to get that one out. Um, and for those next slide, for those of you not going, um, you can watch it live. Uh, Whiskey Five Kilo Uniform Bravo. Uh, Dot com. He always does a full, I mean, it's live. I don't know if it's 24 hours a day, but it's live a lot. Even his trip driving there is live. And he's got a lot of donated prizes. So you guys, when you get in the chat room for at Whiskey 5 KUB, you can actually win prizes. Um, also, uh, if you go to Ustream.com and just search Dara Live or AMSET, uh, they're also going to be doing live feeds as well, as well. So even though you can't be there, it can feel like you're there. Um, and the last thing I want to mention um, if, um, is um, uh, some VHFers are planning a dinner that Friday night at Dayton. And uh, Kim Hensley is organizing it, Whiskey Golf 8 Sierra now. They're kind of looking for a miracle here because they don't have enough. Um, and so they, they don't want to have to get rid of the dinner. So 
They're looking for a miracle, and so I'm hoping our Ham Nation viewers can come through. If you don't have any plans at Dayton for Friday night, and you're into VHF, UHF, microwave, uh, EME, weak signal, um, don't go out to dinner or some restaurant with the guys you go to every Saturday morning breakfast with. You want to go meet some new people, so go to this VHF dinner. Um, Friday night, it's uh, 6 o'clock at the Doubletree Suites in Miamisburg, Ohio. 6 o'clock, it's open bar. That's kind of nice. <laughs> and then dinner at 7. And it's uh, $48.98 or $50.45, depending how you pay. But uh, that's a pretty good, pretty good deal with an open bar, not a cash bar. So uh, that sounds like it'll be a lot of fun. So, um, But you have... 24 hours to let them know you want to you you want in because um, right now they don't quite have enough folks so we need to get the get some more people going to that thing so they don't have to cancel it but it'd be really a good time for uh, you guys if you're really into the VHF and UHF band so um, that's all I've got as far as my slides and so now I'm going to air part three of an oldie but goodie uh, L O T W. I'm going to show you how to upload your log so you're going to go in and pull up your TQSL icon. Click on sign an existing log for later. So we're going to go in there, grab an ADIF file, and we're going to click on your home QTH, which we've already set up in another episode. Click OK. Make sure it's OK. You can leave those dates blank. Put in your password, and then click OK. Now it's uploading the log. Now that's showing that I have duplicates because I was testing it out, showing you how to do that. But you're normally not going to get that. Now, for those of you who don't have a logging software, I'm going to show you how to create one from scratch. So you're going to go ahead and then click that Create Log option there. And it's going to bring up a box for you. And you're going to enter the call sign that you worked. And you're going to go ahead and put in the date you worked them and the time in UTC, which is pretty self-explanatory. And you get a drop down box for the modes. You need to select the mode and then a drop down box for the band and for the RX band. And then go ahead and put in your frequency. If they work split, you know, you got to put in the two different frequencies. And then hit add a cue. So if you want to add another one, now it's going to leave a lot of that same information there so you don't have to retype it all in again if you worked a bunch of people on 20 meters a lot of that will stay there and you just have to maybe change the time so that makes it real convenient just keep adding a QSO and when you get to the last QSO you don't have to hit add QSO you just need to hit OK and it will store that last QSO so hit OK and now we're going to save that ADIF file and it's ready to be certified. So let's go in and certify that ADIF file now. Click the file, hit OK, and click the home QTH, OK, yep, that's correct. Skip the dates, put in your password. Believe me, after you do this about 10 times, it's going to be so easy. It's, it seems difficult at first, but it just gets really easy. And that one is certified and ready to be uploaded to LOTW. So let's go ahead and click on that LOTW icon. And we're going to go ahead and lo it'll log, bring us up to LOTW. Now I'm logging in as my daughter's call sign. And these are not real QSO. So I'm just going to show you how to upload. Hit the upload file. And you're going to go and select the file that we just made. They see the TQ8 file right there. Hit OK. And then you would hit that upload button, which I'm not going to do because it's not a real QSO. But I'm going to log in right now as me. So you can see I have a very active LOTW account. So I can kind of show you around and um, you can see what LOTW um, can offer you once you start using them on a regular basis. They, they track your awards for you, which is really cool. And there's a lot of cool awards on here uh, that a lot of people go after. Obviously, the first one is DXCC. And that's a biggie that's trying to get 100 countries worked. Um, and It'll track that for you. Once they get confirmed, it'll automatically update that for you. You don't have to worry about that. There's also WAS or Worked All States. And WPX is a new one they've recently added. Um, and that's prefixes. So like NV9 would be one, NV8 would be another, and W9 would be another one, and W8 would be another. So let's go into WAS. There's my WAS. As you can see, I need some states on some bands and modes uh, but uh, that's where you can track on and you can click on any of those blue 
uh, modes or bands, and it'll give you even more detail. So here's WPX, um, and that's a that's a biggie. Um, and then let's go back and uh, we'll show you how to look at your DXCC award, which is the big one. Now, if we look at DXCC, they also have what's called the challenge. Now, once people get their 340 countries and so they have them all, they may want to go after the challenge, which may be to get 3,000 countries worked on uh, multiple bands or to uh, go after their five band DXCC or things like that and this is a good place to track that um, you can go and look and say do I need Spratly on 20 meters and you can find out right here that no you don't have it confirmed uh, also you can sort this either alphabetically by the name of the DXCC country or entity or you can sort it by the DXCC country code so uh, it's a very handy tool uh, if you're really hot and heavy into DXing and getting a lot of countries worked on a lot of different bands. Uh, this is really uh, a cool tool to use. So that's part one, two, and three. All you need to know to get set up for LOTW. Okay, that thing's about four years old because <laughs> I have like double the QSO since that aired. Hey, uh, I forgot to give you how to contact uh, them for the VHF dinner. So hopefully you guys can help them out uh, and have a good time in the process with an open bar. So QRZ, I'm not going to give an email out over the air, but QRZ Whiskey Golf 8 Sierra. That's Whiskey Golf 8 Sierra, Kim Hensley. And uh, tell him, uh, you know, send him an email that you want to go to the dinner and he'll uh, send you a PayPal invoice or uh, I think is how it works. So uh, if you can't remember that, email me and I will forward it on to them. So um, that's all I've got for this week. So next week's the big week. We're going to be in Dayton. And, you know, uh, Don talked about DX Engineering. They're going to be revealing something cool, something really big. And hopefully it'll be there Wednesday night. I'm hoping they'll have it up Wednesday night when we're uh, broadcasting live. But uh, anyway, I want to pass it to Amanda. Well, thank you, Valerie. Thanks for answering that last question there. That was a big one. Where do we sign up for that dinner? Open bar, dude. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's from a, from a movie. All right. Let's get to the questions here. George, this one was for your... Your transmitter site, is there a UPS to cover the time the generator needs to turn on? Only for the equipment in the rack. Uh, yeah, 50 bucks. Uh, yeah, a, a UPS that could cover a 50 kilowatt yeah, AM transmitter. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're talking about my generator's 130 kW, so uh, yeah, that would be outrageous for a UPS. Agreed. Yeah, that's that's crazy. We have some backup power and stuff here at our repeater sites and nothing has AM on it and it doesn't work so well most of the time. So, all right. One other question. George, I'm going to send this to you first. When running a coax feed line, when do you have to coil a few loops at the antenna for an RF choke? Do you always have to for VHF, UHF and HF? That's all the info I have. Yeah, I don't really do it on VHF and UHF. I do it on HF, and I don't do it on every antenna, mainly if I've got an issue with um, some RFI in the shack. You know, the, your signal can re-radiate back down the shield of the cable into your shack, and then it gets into your equipment in there. And also, having that RF out on the shield of the cable is not really putting it in the air where you want to. So um, that's uh, the, the most that, um, that I would use one. And, you know, they're kind of handy to have. Look up Ugly Ballon and you'll find all kinds of information on it. There you go. I hope that answered your question, Pierre. Next question is for all of you because you've all been to Dayton. Just give me your quickest answer. What's the first thing that you look forward to now when you get to Dayton? Just give me some info for the newbies out there. What what should they do first? Uh, Don, you go first. Well, um, the first thing I do is I, I seriously, and this is not just because I have all these around my neck. I stop at the uh, Venture Crew 73 and I buy a lanyard because like I've, I've got a lanyard thing 
a fetish. I don't know, whatever. I just, I, I like lanyards. I think they're cool. And, uh, I've got a whole bunch of them back here kind of hanging just uh, out of the camera shot. But that's the first thing I do. And then after that, it's just I just roam around and and see if I can find some friends. I go check in with uh, check in with Heil and check in with, uh, you know, whoever the Newsline crew happens to be and uh, roam around and see what I can find. I don't really typically don't have a, a set thing that I like to do. But the first thing I do is literally I do. I pick up I pick up one of these lanyards and it, they're, they're great. They're cheap. Go get you one. Okay, Valerie, what about you? Yeah, we get the lanyards too when we go. Um, and uh, just, you know, I used to be a venture crew female <laughs> advisor and my daughter was in venture crew, so I like supporting them. Um, we we go around and we look for our friends that we only get to see once a year um, and love going to uh, the manufacturer booths and checking out the new technology. And um, I really love the nighttime. There's so much to do at night. You can't even fit it all in. So I have I have a lot of fun at night. Like uh, the band playing Friday night by the numbers, Friday night, super sweet, 10 o'clock. That'll be fun. There you go. So there's nightlife as well. Who knew? Um, George, what do you do? Well, generally the first thing I do is get off the plane and <laughs> rush to the rental car. Uh, lot there so I, I can get a car before they're all gone uh, but yeah generally uh, we don't come in until Thursday night and there's an event going on Thursday nights that's uh, kind of closed it's a dealer event it's it's uh, not a you know open to the public and we usually go to that we usually get invited to it and have a good time there but when I actually get to the Hamvention site, the first thing I do, of course, is go go find uh, your tickets or your credentials, whatever you need to get in there. Um, y you're going to need that for sure. And then, I don't know from there, it's anybody's guess. I generally try to find the Ham Nation booth, though, which is always right beside the Howl Sound booth. After that, uh, boy, it, you know, I don't know. I'm dragging around a camera with me for a good bit of it. So what I do is probably a little different than, than what the average person uh, does. If it was just me and I was just going, I would head to the flea market. And that's what I'm going to try to do this year. Uh, I, I messed up last year. I waited until after the rain had set in. So uh, I'm going to try to hit the flea market early this year. See, and I'm and just okay, the opposite. I'm not, a, I'm not a flea market guy. So I'm just the opposite. I'm not a flea market guy. I like the inside stuff, the uh, the manufacturer stuff, but uh, I do hit the flea market periodically. So Val, what were you saying? Yeah, I, I don't flea market either. When I first started in the hobby, I got burned a couple of times. So um, I try and buy from friends. Um, but Amanda, I have a question for you. Go um, ahead. What do we have to do? You, one, just one year to get you there, you and Jeff there. It's, it's such a rough time because we do the printing for the graduation program and it's such a tight schedule. So I'd have to go like on a Friday afternoon and come home on Sunday evening. And I then did that once. I couldn't get off work. I, I flew out Friday afternoon and I had a ball. So and that's I think that's how I can try. make it there. <laughs> I will. We will have to try definitely. And Bob had mentioned that too. We've got to get you out there somehow. So we'll see. Maybe, maybe 2000, 2019 will be the year. Um, all right, I know we're a little over time here. Let's go over the nets. The D-Star net, unfortunately, is having some issues. So that's a no-go for tonight. We have 20 meters on 14.268. And to find Kevin around 71.92, that's usually his happy spot. Then we have a do drop in for the Echo Link net. And let's not forget DMR on TAC 311. So we have all of those. Now, who's wrapping up the show tonight? Uh, I don't. I don't know. George, you want to wrestle for it? Uh, no, I I won the head toss last week. So why don't you do it this week? The head toss. We tossed heads. <laughs> yeah, you wow. had already gone. I think so. You <laughs> oh, missed well, out so on all. Yeah, well, that's what I got. <laughs> no, you toss a coin. Yeah. Heads roll. That's toss what. Yeah. Coin. That's, that's ah. right. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's tough crowd. <laughs> All right, y'all. Well, thank you for uh, thank you for being here. 
And uh, yeah, W5KUB does his uh, webcast uh, from uh, Dayton. He also does it from Huntsville. He does his drive to and from Huntsville. Huntsville, of course, is three months after Dayton, and that's also when we do the Young Ham of the Year Award. And he also webcasts our Young Ham of the Year presentation at the Huntsville Ham Fest. So uh, yeah, Tom and the whole guys at W5KUB.com are great friends of of what we do here, all of us here. So uh, always happy to help him out. All right, guys, we will be back. Uh, same bat time, same bat channel here next Wednesday night at 8 p. Central for Ham Nation. And we hope you will be too. So for, uh, for Bob and Gordo and the rest of the uh, assembled cast of idiots, it's Don, AE5DW, and actually... I am well-based. See you all next week. Good night, everybody. I'm not.